Good morning, church. Welcome to worship. My name is Todd Jordan. I serve as senior pastor here at Strawbridge United Methodist Church, and we are delighted that you are here this morning. It is the Sunday of Pentecost, and we'll talk more about what that means later on in worship. It is also Memorial Day weekend, so I'm going to invite you to say at least three prayers this weekend while you're out grilling or eating or doing whatever, however you're going to celebrate Memorial Day. I want you to say three prayers. One, uh, thank God for those uh, who gave their lives to protect our democracy and our freedom. Pray for those who are currently serving in the military, either here at home or abroad. And three, pray for the day when military is no longer necessary because God's peace is established here on earth as it is in heaven. And thank you for the ways that you are going to do that. Uh, if you are visiting with us, a special welcome to you. If you are worshiping online, a special welcome to you as well. Uh, God is present in this place. And as we uh, prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, I want to invite you to take a deep breath and enter into this time of worship with a sense of wonder. How is God at work in this place? And what will that mean for those of us inside these walls? And what will that mean for the world outside these walls? And so I'm going to invite Elizabeth Sterling. Elizabeth is graduation was last night. So um, I'll tell you what. Uh, as, I as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, I'm going to invite you to stand and join me this morning in our call to worship. Breath of God, breath of life, breath of deepest yearning, come Holy Spirit, comforter, disturber, interpreter, inspirer, come Holy Spirit, heavenly friend, Lamplighter, revealer of truth, midwife of change. Come, Holy Spirit, the Lord is here. God's Spirit is with us. Amen.
our faith together. We sing of God the Spirit, who from the beginning has swept over the face of creation, animating all energy and matter and moving the human heart. We sing of God the Spirit, faithful and untamable, who is creatively and redemptively acting in the world. The Spirit challenges us to celebrate the holy, not only in what is familiar, but also in what seems foreign. We sing of the Spirit, who speaks our prayers of deepest longing and enfolds our concerns and confessions, transforming us and the world. We offer worship as an outpouring of gratitude and awe, and a practice of opening ourselves to God's still, small voice of comfort, to God's rushing whirlwind of challenge. Through word, music, art, and sacrament, in community and in solitude, God changes our lives, our relationships, and our world. Amen. God, we come together with grateful hearts. We are grateful for the freedom to worship you. And this weekend, we remember and we are grateful for those who laid down their lives to defend our freedoms. And God, we thank you for the gift of your church, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. So Holy One, we come ready to receive anew the gifts of your Spirit that will give us vision to form and reform ourselves as a people of Pentecost. Come, Holy Spirit, come and be a new reality. Free us from fear. Give us courage to speak of your marvelous ways and of your hope so that we may live each day fully. Come, Holy Spirit, come and be a new reality. Awaken us so that we may be bold to be the body of Christ's presence in the world renewing our life together, renewing the world. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and be a new reality. Spirited wind of change, enable the bending of what is rigid and the reversal of what has gone astray, the freshness of new possibility. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and be a new reality. Come as comforter and offer us and all your people relief, consolation, and companionship. Tend to our woundedness. Restore us to life that we may be healers. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and be a new reality. Reconciler and spirit for justice. Empower our, prophet, our prophet's voice that it might be heard through the land, retelling the gospel vision praying for the unity of all true spirits. Come, Holy Spirit, come. You are the reason this gathering is a holy place. Come, Holy Spirit, and be a new reality. And as we yearn for this reality, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward for the children's conversation with Becca Reed. Good morning. How are you? Hello, hello. Oh, I like those. Good morning. Come on. Good morning. How are y'all? So, anything exciting going on? Do y'all notice something different? Who am I? I'm a stranger. <laughs> Pastor Emily, do y'all know where Pastor Emily is? She's on vacation. For her, yeah, her birthday. Can y'all say happy birthday to Pastor Emily, even though she's not here? Birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Pastor Emily. Okay, so what else is going on? It's Pentecost. Is there anything else exciting going on? It's close to Memorial Day. What season is it? Summer. Summer. So I brought some stuff in my big old bag, as Lily likes to call it. Um, some stuff that I like to do during the summer and that they like. I hope, Lily, I hope you don't mind. Do you all know what this is? What is this? A kite. Okay, that's pretty fun. It is yours. What are these? Bubbles. And then what about this? Does anybody know what this is? Kind of like a windmill. Anybody know what it could be called? A, a pinwheel. What do all of these things have in common? What do we need for these things to work? Some air or some wind. Can you all make a wind noise for me? Oh, that was pretty good. So we're going to be listening and hearing the story of Pentecost today. And in the story, God sends a loud wind. Can you all be louder? Let's try to pretend. Imagine what that would sound like. Love it. That was perfect. Yes. Now, here's the thing about wind. Can we see wind? No. Sometimes it can be really hard when we can't see things to believe in it. But we can feel the wind, right? And God sent the Holy Spirit. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but we can feel it. It comforts us, it guides us, and it helps us, right? Do y'all ever get nervous? Ever? Never? Maybe if you have something big like a game or you have a song you have to sing in front of people. Yeah. So whenever you get nervous, the Holy Spirit can come and make you feel better. Right? I was really nervous having to come up here and talk to y'all because I'm not Pastor Emily. But you know what? I prayed and the Holy Spirit calmed me and made me feel better. Right? Okay. So today, to help you remember that the Holy Spirit is always with you, I'm going to give you a pinwheel. Right? Yes. Ah, but we're going to, what do we always do at the end of children's moment? What should we do? Pray. We're going to pray. All right, can you all bow your heads with me so we can pray? Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time together, and we thank you so much for Pastor Emily, and we thank you for our congregation and for all of these children, and we thank you so much today for the Holy Spirit as it guides us and teaches us and comforts us. In your name we pray, amen. All right. Uh, congregation, we ask that you stand and greet one another.
be seated today for our scripture reading. Our scripture reading today is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 and 12 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own na native language? All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the 11, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. You. So if you ask me, what is the key to genius? The key to genius is not IQ or how smart you are or think you are. The key to genius is one word. It's curiosity. It's simple curiosity. If you are curious, genuinely curious. It doesn't matter how smart or slow you are, whatever your IQ may be, uh, however many degrees you have. Uh, if you're curious and approach any person, situation, or subject with curiosity, you will never stop growing. You will never stop learning. And at some point, you even and probably will stumble across something absolutely brilliant or genius. The key to genius is curiosity. It might have killed the cat, but it's actually led to some amazing and important discoveries. Curiosity, the curiosity of knowing the reason behind the fall of an apple that led Isaac Newton to come up with the laws of motion. Uh, other geniuses, Kepler, Einstein, and so many, many others, driven not by how smart they were, but by how curious they were. Not by how many answers they had, but how many questions they had. The ability and the drive to simply wonder about things. This is a good thing. In fact, according to Greater Good magazine, for children and adults alike, curiosity has been linked with psychological, emotional, social, and even health benefits. Curious people are happier people. Research has shown that curiosity is associated with higher levels of positive emotions, lower levels of anxiety, more satisfaction with life, and greater psychological well-being. 
Curiosity boosts achievement. Studies reveal that curiosity leads to more enjoyment and participation in school and higher academic achievement, as well as greater learning, achievement, and performance at work. Curiosity can expand our empathy. Being, uh, we become better able to understand those with lives, experiences, and worldviews different than our own when we're curious about others. Curiosity helps to strengthen relationships. One study found that people were rated as warmer and more attractive if they showed curiosity in an exchange of conversation. And curiosity has been shown to improve health care. Research suggests that when doctors are genuinely curious about their patients' perspectives, both doctors and patients report less anger and frustration, make better decisions, and ultimately increases the effectiveness of their treatment. Curiosity is good for us. It is also critical to our faith. Curiosity is critical to spiritual health and well-being. A few weeks ago, you may have noticed that in worship, whenever we, we, we begin worship and I welcome you, I have lately been inviting you to be curious about what God may do in the midst of worship, either to us, for us, or through us. This isn't just because I woke up and thought that that would be a cool way to start worship. It's because that I think it is critical. Holy curiosity is critical to faith. Always asking, what is God up to in the world or in my life or in this particular situation? Where is God working in the midst of my ordinary mundane life? And even when times are difficult for us, being able to ask, how can God teach me in this crisis? Or show, what can God show me? Or how can God grow me? in this crisis. You see, when we're spiritually curious, there is a degree of openness, a degree of vulnerability and availability, along with expectation and humility, all of which are necessary for our faith. In fact, Jesus when he instructs us to become like a child in order, to the, the, in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. I believe part of that quality is to be curious like a child. And it keeps us humble. What is God up to? What new thing is God doing? And how might I be invited to be a part of it? And I would also ask, what signs and opportunities are we missing in our lives, in our ordinary days, where God may be working in our midst and we miss it because we doubt or don't even bother looking? I would argue that those who benefited the most in Acts chapter 2 were the ones who were approaching that situation with a certain degree of holy curiosity. The ones who benefited most at the day of Pentecost were the ones who were curious, the ones who were available and open to God's working a new possibility in the world. We find in Acts chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, that all the crowd who gathered that day were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? They were the ones who benefited, but there were those who sneered and said, oh man, they just got into the new wine. They're a little, right? How quickly, how too ready are we to explain away 
when God is working something new in our midst right in front of our eyes. Look, there's nothing wrong with healthy uh, skepticism in this world. Let me just tell you right now, it is important to have a healthy dose of skepticism to question, 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 right? But when we chronically, habitually doubt or try to explain away what God is accomplishing in plain sight. This is not helpful for the kingdom work. This is not good for us. It is not good for the church. It is not good for the world. God shows up in strange, unexpected ways. Sometimes God shows up in a still, small voice and can speak to us in a quiet whisper. Sometimes also, like in Psalm 50, verse 3, our God comes and does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around him. This is what's happening at that moment of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, we read that the Holy Spirit shows up with the sound of a rushing or violent wind. And flames of divided tongues went with each of the disciples. Like flame and tempest, God is speaking, God is working. When the Holy Spirit uh, shows up, things happen. Something is different when those are begin speaking and receiving and responding to the work of the Holy Spirit. The result is transformation. Lives are changed. The world is changed. But when the Holy Spirit moves, there must be speakers ready to speak. There must be hearers ready to hear. There must be receivers ready to receive. Acts chapter 2 would have gone nowhere if the disciples were too afraid to say anything. Stayed quiet, stayed silent when God was moving. But notice how God uh, rests upon each one of them. So there's this individual element to it, and at the same time, they're all together. And then when they go out to the crowd, uh, again, the Holy Spirit, uh, Scripture says, the crowd gathered around to hear, but all of them hearing in their own individual language. Speakers must be ready to speak. Hearers must be ready to receive with open ears, open minds, and open hearts hearts, but not everybody in the crowd, while they all could understand in their own language, sadly not everyone was listening. Some were too busy sneering and explaining away the events around them. But for the ones who were paying attention, this was a reversal of Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. Y'all remember that story? Go back and take a look at Genesis chapter 11 when humans get the bright idea of building a tower all the way to heaven, right? We don't need God. We can do it ourselves. We're smart enough. And so they build this tower. The joke in Genesis 11, by the way, is um, that uh, God has to hear about what the people are doing from angels. And then when God decides to take a look, has to bend down to see what they're doing, right? And, and because the humans, you know, we, we don't need God. We've got intellect. We've got our own technology. We'll do it ourselves. They don't get very far. They start fighting and arguing, right? Because when you know everything, you don't need to listen to the person next to you. And so they become divided. They become confused. There is chaos. And it reminds us of Psalm 127.1, that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And so when we try to do it on our own, with our own knowledge with our own technology, without God, the result is chaos, misunderstanding, confusion, and division. Everyone thinks they know everything. Everyone thinks they have all the answers. And listen to me, if you get nothing else from this sermon, listen to this. Human arrogance and pride are not only the enemies of curiosity, they are the enemies of genius and of faith. Human arrogance and pride, knowing it all or thinking that we do, having all the answers will not get you far. It is being open 
to learning and growing and seeing what is new. When God shows up to build the house, the things that once divided us become melt, be, become, begin to melt away. Our different languages, our different cultures, different countries of origin, different colors, different perspectives, different ways of thinking, different ways of living, all break down in the face of the Holy Spirit, all come together and bring about this community. And when Peter was done preaching, 3,000 people joined the church, got over their differences, and came together to become uh, what historians refer to frequently as the birth of the Christian church. The Holy Spirit is still working and blowing and burning in our midst today. In fact, um, how many people know the name William J. Seymour? This is a picture of him. This is William J. Seymour. Anybody know that name? No? Now, if I asked how many people know the name John Calvin or Martin Luther or John Wesley, I'd see a few hands. So who was this guy? What did he do? Let me tell you about William J. Seymour, black Methodist preacher. Uh, on the night of April 9th, 1906, in Los Angeles, California, uh, Reverend Seymour and seven other men were waiting on God to show up on Bonnie Bray Street when, quote, suddenly, as though hit by a bolt of lightning, they were knocked from their chairs to the floor. Seymour began preaching, and the other sev seven men began to speak in tongues, uh, shouting praises to God. News of this spread quickly. The city was stirred up. Crowds began to gather. Services had to be moved from outside the building they were in in order to accommodate the crowd who came from all around. Revivals, this revival, these worship services that emerged would happen throughout the day, uh, seven days a week. This revival went on for over three years, around the clock. It's what historians refer to as the Azusa Street Revival. And so eventually, to accommodate the crowds, uh, they found an old dilapidated two-story frame building on 312 Azusa Street that had once been an African Methodist Episcopal Church. And by, so that was on April 9th. Uh, by mid-May, just a, a month later, anywhere from 300 to 1,500 people would be crammed in the building Historians say that worship was frequent, spontaneous, and services going almost around the clock for three years. First-hand accounts included reports of the blind receiving their sight. Diseases cured instantly. Immigrants speaking in German, Yiddish, and Spanish, all being spoken to in their native language by uneducated black members in attendance who translated the languages into English by, quote, supernatural ability. Sounds a little bit like Acts chapter 2. What I find particularly fascinating, I mean, all the, 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 the curing of the blind and the diseases and the translation, that's impressive. But think about this. In 1906, Jim Crow laws were at their height. And this was still uh, 14 years prior to women being able to vote in the United States. And yet in this place, people from a diversity of backgrounds came to worship God all together. Men, women, children, black, white, Asian, Native American, immigrants, rich, poor, illiterate, educated. People flocked to Los Angeles from all over. Some of them skeptical, wanted to see what was going on. Others hopeful, looking for something new in their lives. One observer wrote this, quote, no instruments of music are used, none are needed. No choir, the angels have been heard by some in the spirit. No collections are 
are taken. No bills have been posted to advertise the meetings. No church organization is back of it. All who are in touch with God realize as soon as they enter the meetings that the Holy Ghost is the leader. But not everybody was impressed. Some sneered and criticized. Um, in the Los Angeles Times, there was a description of the worship that was not so flattering. It said, meetings are held in a tumble-down shack on Azusa Street, and the devotees of the weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites, preach the wildest theories, and work themselves into a state of mad excitement in their peculiar zeal, and night is made hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshipers who spend hours swaying forth and back in a nerve-wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. They claim to have the, quote, gift of tongues and be able to understand all the babble. It's like they're drunk on new wine. But here's what another writer wrote. This was in the Apostolic Faith publication. Said this about some visitors that came to check out the worship services. Proud, well-dressed preachers came to investigate. Soon their high looks were replaced with wonder. Then conviction comes, and very often you will find them in a short time wallowing on the dirty floor, asking God to forgive them and make them as little children. Sounds like Pentecost. So the core membership of the Azusa Street Mission Never got more than 50 or 60 individuals at one time, and yet thousands of people over those period of three years um, were, were touched in powerful ways there. Today, that revival is considered by historians the primary catalyst for the spread of Pentecostalism in the 20th century, and now that movement boasts over six hundred million adherents. Hmm. Methodist Church only has 13 million. Just saying. Look, I'm not saying we got to worship like charismatics. That's not the point. We don't need to speak in tongues or get slain in the Spirit. We don't have to. Um, that's how the Holy Spirit showed up in that particular place at that particular time for that particular group of people and still does for people all over the world. That's great. Our job um, is simply to worship God in spirit and in truth in the way that we are used to, in the way of our tradition that works for us. Letting the Holy Spirit show up and work how it will work. But look, there's nothing wrong with a little enthusiasm when you come to church. And I'm just saying an occasional amen would not kill anybody. Uh, thank you. Um, but look, how one worships, that's not the point, right? We can't forget uh, that, that we have, look, th this whole movement was started by a Methodist. We have this in our blood, in our DNA. In fact, John Wesley got kicked out of preaching at a lot of chapels because he showed too much enthusiasm. I've seen y'all watch sporting events. I know enthusiasm is part of it, part of y'all. Um, but we worship in our tradition, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and we've got the Holy Spirit in our movement. In fact, it's in our very logo, the United Methodist Church logo, the cross and flame. Why is that flame there? It represents what? The Holy Spirit, right? That was Wesley's vision for Methodism. Not that it would be tra uh, trapped uh, and contained within an institution, but that it would spread uh, scriptural holiness like wildfire throughout the land. And by the way, does anybody happen to know, this is just a, a trivia, why there are two parts to the flame? 1968, the merger between the Evangelical United Brethren and the Methodist Church to form the United Methodist Church. That's what's represented in the two bits of that flame. But the flame is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we are to always worship in spirit and in truth. So the question isn't what style or form should our worship take. 
but simply this. When the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, shows up, will you be ready to receive it and to respond to it? I ask because I'm curious. Amen. Pastor Emily's not here, so I'm going to invite us into a word of prayer <laughs> as the ushers come forward. Uh, let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you with our giving. Bless these gifts for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm gonna sing till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna sing till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna sing till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna sing till Jesus come. I'm gonna sing till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna sing till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna sing till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna sing till Jesus comes. Moves in my heart, I'm gonna sing till the spirit moves in my heart, I'm gonna sing till Jesus comes. I'm gonna pray till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna pray till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna pray till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna pray till Jesus come. I'm gonna shout till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna shout till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna shout till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna shout till Jesus comes. I'm gonna shout till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna shout till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna shout till the spirit moves in my heart. I'm gonna shout till Jesus comes. and holy God, we thank you for this opportunity to return back to you a small portion of which you've already given to us in abundance through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. We simply ask that you would receive these gifts, bless them, multiply them, send them into the world for the building of your kingdom, that you may be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whenever we gather for worship, it is an opportunity to receive the word of God and to respond to the word of God. How will you respond this week? If you are visiting with us and would like to respond by joining our church this morning, you may fill out the blue membership card and come forward and join our church. Uh,
come forward while we re remain standing for our closing hymn. If you are worshiping with us online and you want to know more about the Holy Spirit, what it means to follow Jesus or be a part of our church community, I invite you to give us a call. Send us an email. would love to visit with you about that. Uh, when Peter preached, uh, 3,000 people joined the church. Um, don't necessarily need 3,000 people this morning, but if God is uh, touching your heart, uh, come forward as we remain standing. going to um, uh, invite you all to receive uh, these uh, visitors who are transferring uh, to our church for membership, Linda Ellis and Gail and Dick Treeland. My bad, Ireland. Uh, that's an I, okay. Um, <laughs> I was absent the day they did letters in school, so still working on my reading. Uh, Gordon and Kathy Mayu and Renato and Elizabeth Davia, uh, transferring from other churches. And I will simply ask, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully, to parti faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, answer, I will. And members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified in Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite you all to have a seat on this first pew before we uh, retire, to, or you can go back to your pews, before we retire to the narthex. Uh, I want you all to hear what, what's next. So y'all can have a seat in your pews. I'm going to invite the Stephen ministers to come forward at this time, and Bill Allen. And by the way, I just want to mention, we also got a couple new members this week that are joining us online. Uh, Clint Jordan is a retired United Methodist pastor who will be affiliating with our congregation. And his wife, Linda Jordan, uh, is now a member of our church as well. They reside in San Antonio, worship with us online every week week and we are so happy to have Clint and Linda Jordan. Hi mom, hi dad. <laughs> Welcome to Strawbridge. So we have Stephen Ministers up in front of us. Bill, tell us a little bit about the Stephen Ministers that we have and then we will pray and commission them. So Todd, as uh, Stephen ministers and Stephen leaders, we bring three new Stephen ministers for your blessing and commissioning. Mary Jo Weisner, Pamela Messenger, and Gail Nall. 
They all have long associations with the United Methodist Church. They're well known to me and to us. Uh, we're blessed to have three highly qualified folks with long professional careers in education and counseling. They've completed more than 50 hours of training to uh, provide Christian caring for folks going through the normal problems that we all come to face in life, losses of family member, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, and I commend them to you for commissioning and blessing. Great. So we have three new Stephen ministers that we're adding to our group of Stephen ministers. So congratulations. <laughs> Every Stephen minister has received over 50 hours of training. They are volunteers and they are ready to just listen um, for you, to you or anyone you know who may be dealing with something that life has thrown at them that is difficult. Uh, let us know, or if you want to know more about Stephen Ministry, you can see Bill Allen as well. But let us pray for you. Gracious and holy God, we thank you that you have called and raised leaders uh, with a gift for listening, a gift for compassion and pastoral care. And as these three uh, join uh, the ranks of Stephen Ministers, which are, are throughout churches all over, uh, we thank you, we ask you to bless them and to be a blessing to others. And we thank you for the ways that we, they will serve your church and grow your kingdom through acts of compassion and care. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So I'm going to invite our Stephen ministers to um, return to your pews. I'm going to invite our new members at this time. Um, I'm going to ask Pastor Lindsay to escort you all to the narthex so that you can be greeted and welcomed by our church. And I um, just want to thank all of you uh, for all the ways that you are opening your ears, opening your eyes, opening your hearts and your minds to the movement of the Holy Spirit in your life, in our church, and in our world for the purpose of expanding God's kingdom here on earth. Won't you please rise now for our blessing and dismissal? Oh, and pray for our Texas Annual Conference. We have annual conference beginning tonight. For those of you that know what that means, thank you for your prayers. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And the church said, Amen. Amen.